today uh, we prepared a panel uh, that's uh, not made up of technologists, although one of them is actually a licensed engineer and a medical doctor. But we wanted to uh, present to you uh, a view from uh, geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas, which we think are our target uh, audience uh, for this discussion. So, so I'd like to call uh, on screen right now, right? Uh, we have from Deloitte Brazil, Tiago, Novais, and Olimpio. Um, can you confirm that they're online? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Um, thank you very much for joining us. And then I'll call uh, Dr. Miguel Aljibe from UP Manila Standards Interoperability Lab and Surgical Innovation and Biotechnology Lab. A big hand for Dr. Aljibe. Dr. Alhibe, by the way, is both a licensed physician and a licensed ECE, mechanical engineer, sorry, LME. So he's a rare combination of uh, health and uh, technology. And I don't know if we have Dr. Theo. Uh, Dr. Theo Capedin is a former doctor to the barrio. Tony, were we able to get? Okay. So uh, we'll have. Uh, Tiago Novais and Dr. Miguel Aljibe. Okay. Um, maybe Tiago, um, you can give us just a uh, a statement or a summary of the work that Deloitte Brazil has done around uh, work uh, on health applications over Oran. Tiago. Uh, yes, so uh, we have uh, conducted a project here which is called Open Care 5G, and it's about using Open RAN or address connectivity to help uh, health cases, but not considering when we usually talk about health cases, we consider um, let's say, more complex health cases such as remote surgery. And what we did was actually uh, combine a use case that is relevant for healthcare universalization uh, in Brazil and combining with that advanced connectivity and how to, we, we can um, overcome some of the barriers uh, in, in such a big country uh, such as Brazil. Um, thank you, Tiago. Uh, Dr. Miguel, maybe a perspective from the ground, uh, some challenges that doctors face uh, when they're in environments that uh, don't have connectivity. So um, a lot of the, uh, in a lot of regions here in the Philippines and actually uh, in the world, we have, um, when we have problems with the connectivity, we, are, we have issues, of course, with being able to send patient data as well as, for example, re, uh, insurance reimbursements uh, to the uh, main or central government authorities. So that's one of the issues that some of the doctors will have. We will have doctors in geographically isolated areas. They will get patients with very difficult uh, diseases, for example, trauma, surgical cases. And they sometimes need guidance because our community doctors are the ones at the front lines. They need guidance on how to manage at least, uh, give the initial management for some of these diseases. And if we don't have good connectivity, they don't get access to the specialists in the urban areas or in the central areas for them to be able to give the right uh, form of treatment. So as I shared earlier in the media briefing, uh, if you all remember during the first few days of the pandemic and we were all on a lockdown, what did we do? If we wanted to talk to our doctors, we did telemedicine and we, we had a discussion with them. We set appointments through Zoom or any video conferencing platform. Uh, and from St. Luke's, that really uh, allowed us to continue uh, serving the patients. Of course, we could not meet them in the clinic. The clinics were closed. Uh, but you can imagine that in the islands or what we call geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas, they are in a perpetual lockdown. What do I mean? They don't have access. They don't have access to the health services. 
especially those that are in high up in the boondocks or in the remote islands and there's just a few of them in the islands they don't have any recourse except to you know ride the boat and take the boat to the mainland uh, or go down the mountain and take their half a day one day uh, trek uh, to the rural health unit and usually in these rural health units that are in the kabayanan they will be lucky if there is a doctor. Uh, that's why we have the Doctors to the Barrio program, so that uh, in these sparsely populated areas, we would have a doctor to serve them. Um, maybe, Tiago, uh, a perspective on what were your pain points uh, when you started your uh, project uh, on health and ORAN? Tiago, pain points? Uh, yes. So we, I mean, we actually... Uh, what we did was a, a, a controlled uh, small pilot just to test the connectivity. Uh, we do want to go to more remote regions, uh, but we focus more on a top-down, uh, on a bottom-up approach uh, with a remote ultrasound. Uh, but the, the challenges, well, I think there 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 are there is a technical technological challenge. Uh, which was, you know, um, the companies that worked uh, with uh, with this uh, ORAN approach, they were actually understanding that uh, the technology itself. So uh, we spent a, a little bit of time playing around uh, with the components and 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 just to bring everything up. Uh, so it was a learning curve uh, for us. Uh, and well, what we understood is that. The technology is very good, but it's not yet plug and play if you want to go full or ran. Um, and also another challenge, which is not technological, is more on the business side, was setting up a ecosystem of companies which have complementary pro uh, profile to bring that use case into, into reality. Thank you, Tiago. Dr. Meeks, um... If we had good connectivity in the islands, what are the possibilities uh, that UP Manila or the Philippine General Hospital can offer to these remote islands? Assuming that we were able to lay down uh, and you know there's uh, good connectivity in those areas, just give them something to whet their appetite. Yes, well. Actually, uh, a lot of the research institutions here in the Philippines have been working on um, telemedicine and telehealth devices that allows uh, one, some sort of video conferencing between the patient and the doctor so that they don't have to go to the hospital that's in the mainland. So that makes it easy for them to consult a doctor. And that actually promotes health-seeking behavior because you're making it easy for the patient. And the DOSD actually has the RxBox system for this. And in addition, such systems are also able to collect vital signs for the patients. Um, I've had a lot of patients who talk to me over Viber. It's very hard to diagnose a patient over Viber. They're just this morning someone was telling me, my ear feels full. I I, I can't see him. I don't know what he looks like. So how can I tell him, oh, you should go to the ER? Or no, don't worry, you can just sleep it off. It's so, not Viber's fault, by the way. It's that it's the limitation of uh, the text messaging system. system yes. So, so having a, uh, an infrastructure, a good connectivity, will allow us to deploy devices that can, let's say, record vital signs and then pass on these vital signs to the doctors. And that gives us a better uh, perspective of what's happening uh, to the patient. So the an on-site or face-to-face -face is still the ideal, but in, in our situation in which we're trying to expand um, our healthcare to the rural areas and to the geographically isolated areas, this is very, very helpful. Yes, and you know, if the DOH program, they already have the doctors to the barrio program. You all know that. You know, that's the program of uh, the former secretary, Clavier. So in, there are actually locations in the country right now where there are doctors to the barrios uh, that are salaried by the Department of Health, but they don't have the connectivity to reach out to the remotest parts of their communities. So I managed a group of doctors to the barrios uh, in 2004 uh, in, uh, in Samar, uh, Leyte, and uh, uh, Surigao, Shargao. And they were telling me that 
uh, in the usually they're placed in the poblacion near beside the uh, municipio and that's okay uh, they have two way radio and they have sms uh, but way back in 2004 they could not even do mms or uh, gprs and what worked for them was just text messaging and give, that, given that that was the only bandwidth that was available they tried to make do with it but we did some research uh, and we had one from batanes a patient in batanes who developed a fracture of uh, the shin bone and developed an, an infection of the fracture so in the old way of doing things what they would usually do in batanes is fly that patient from batanes hospital going to the philippine general hospital and what happened here in this case is that before they sent the patient to the Philippine General Hospital, we coordinated using available technology that time uh, regarding the case of the patient. So we were able to connect the rural doctor in Batanes to the orthopedic surgeon in the Philippine General Hospital, and they were able to converse uh, and exchange uh, ideas on how to, uh, to manage the case. And what turned out in that case is that even if the patient was flown to the Philippine General Hospital that day, he would just lie down in a bed for one week because what you do for cases like that is you load the patient with antibiotics first before you operate on the patient. So just by having the technology to communicate between two points, uh, we were able to tell the doctor, the general practitioner in Batanes, you don't need to bring the patient here because we're, we're just going to put him in a bed for one week and load the antibiotics. We can send you the antibiotics in the next flight and you load him while he's there because we don't want him to take over a bed here in PGH for one week. And another patient can actually be, actually in PGH, we can operate two patients every three days. So that would have been two patients that would have been deprived of a, a, a procedure because there was a osteomyelitis patient uh, lying down waiting for their antibiotics. Um, Tiago, maybe, maybe while I'm sharing some of the stories, you can think of some of the stories that you also have there in Brazil. Um, another patient that I had in Chargao is that this uh, patient uh, had a drinking spree, which is common. <laughs> and uh, there was an argument and he was stabbed in the back. Uh, and uh, he had a stab wound in the back and he was brought to the rural health unit and they were, you know, the doctor there was not a surgeon. So he was very afraid uh, of what's going to happen to this patient. So we communicated. At that time, we only had GPRS and text messaging. And uh, we were able to exchange pictures of the stab wound. Uh, he was able to appraise me on the condition of the patient. And I was able to assure him that, you know, given the descriptions that you have of this patient, it looks like the stab wound at the back did not reach the internal organs of this patient. But don't do this at home, okay? <laughs> don't do this at home. This is basically what telemedicine can do. When you have a communication system between two parties uh, and they agree that uh, this is the communication that we will have, uh, there's the potential for taking care of patients while they are at uh, in their place in the community uh, is just tremendous. But we need connectivity. Um, Tiago, do you have a story right now? Or I'll, I'll um, ask you. Go ahead. Tiago. What What would you have? Uh, and it's interesting because you can really draw a parallel in the Philippines uh, in the Amazon region because um, in order to in order to bring someone to a hospital, you have to, uh, this person needs to travel by boat or by, let's say, uh, a very uh, precarious road. And it could be, you know, days to get to, to a more specialized healthcare center. So um, we do have some solutions that work well, uh, like a ship hospital. Uh, which I think it's kind of a self-explanatory. It's, it's, uh, it's a ship that has all the medical facilities and you go traveling the river in the Amazon rivers uh, to, the, uh, to the remote communities. But the problem with that is scale. Uh, and what 
uh, Brazil has been trying to do is bring the specialists to the remote far, far end. And uh, this is good, but it doesn't scale. So uh, the challenge that we had uh, with Hospital das Clinicas, and uh, I think we are maybe one step uh, behind in terms of uh, of uh, being a widespread solution. What we wanted to, to do is actually uh, start with ultrasound use cases because uh, uh, ultrasound in Brazil, well, first of all, you have to be a full licensed doctor to operate a, 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 a ultrasound device. Um, but if you are in a remote community, you can train someone locally to one, first take, let's say, the most basic images and send them uh, on a more offline um, scheme to a doctor who can then uh, analyze the images. And on more complex use cases, you need a real a real time interaction with a more uh, specialized doctor, uh, and uh, as as you know, because you are you are doctors, uh, the way that you con that you conduct the exam and the way that you actually hold the transceiver makes uh, a lot of difference in obtaining the right image. So that's what uh, we, we we were trying to. I mean, that what we validated over ORAN, you know. Can you actually do it? Uh, how is the latency? How is the experience from the doctor point of view? Uh, and also because we have university, uh, a, a university with us, we are also um, need to address what are the you know the the the, the medical uh, changes in terms of procedures that we need to do. To, 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 to make this available. Thank you, Thiago. Uh, we'll be interested in your ultrasound use case. Actually, uh, there are now portable ultrasounds. Doc France, maybe we can develop some local ultrasound technology. But Dr. Miggs, what are the applications of ultrasound in a community setting? Community setting, of course. Uh, primarily, it can be used for um, pregnant patients, actually, for, for, for checking on, on the babies. And also, it can also be used to detect um, stones, um, gallbladder stones, for example. We actually have a lot of uh, patients in the communities because of the Filipino diet with gallbladder problems. Um, locally, we have some devices, sir, uh, funded by the DOST. Uh, it's called Echo Onsite. It was developed during the pandemic uh, by Dr. Donny Magno and a team from the UP Electronics Institute. Um, the, the concept is actually similar to what Brazil is also doing, that you have an ultrasound device. Uh, you have a device that can capture ultrasound images from an ultrasound machine and then transmit it to the doctor. So the idea is your operator can be um, trained. So it doesn't have to be a doctor like, who's super specialized. It can be just a simple allied health worker and then you can deploy them easily and at scale to the different communities. So going back to that patient with a stab wound at the back, in 2004, if there was an ultrasound in the community back then, I would have asked the doctor there or the trained health worker to do an ultrasound because now with the ultrasound, I can see the bleeding inside the abdomen. That's something that the ultrasound can, 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 uh, can detect. Uh, of course, the growth of the baby uh, in a mother's womb can also be monitored uh, using the ultrasound. And you can do measurements so that you can uh, obtain a longitudinal over time growth of the baby uh, while the baby is still in the womb and you're able to uh, give advice to the mother that the baby is growing fine or very quickly detect uh, if there's any intervention because the baby is not growing uh, normally. Tiago, anything on your side aside from ultrasound? No, uh, as uh, as I said, I think it's a bottom-up approach. So we stick with we started and we are starting with one use case. But uh, the idea is to evolve the project, and it opens in two fronts. One of them is on an urban setting where you have more structure or more infrastructure. Uh, so the idea is to actually go and test it on, a, let's say, a, a city in a more uh, 
in, in within a, an urban environment for more countryside. And then we're going also to the Amazon region to test it uh, remotely. And uh, as I said, we started with the ultrasound because it's uh, a kind of um, democratic and relatively inexpensive device. Uh, but the idea, and this is uh, where USAID might come in, is actually uh, to build a use case where we can expand from this one use case to the many things that you can do uh, with telehealth and establish a model that is, uh, that is a win-win model in, in, in the sense that it helps the public health system, it helps the patient, and it helps uh, the, the, the providers to, to outreach. Because the, the problem with the, the, the healthcare system in Brazil is actually having specialists around such a big country as, as Brazil. Thank you, Thiago. Richard? Can we open the floor later on in case there are questions from the audience? Uh, but while, while we're there, uh, just to share, uh, another application of telemedicine is to detect early childhood blindness. Uh, we don't have enough ophthalmologists in this country. Uh, and there are every person will have two eyes. So we really have a dearth of ophthalmologists in the country. But with telemedicine, we can do a quick screening of the of the ability of the eyes of the child in a community setting and find out whether they have a lagging eye or a lazy eye and these lazy eyes can actually be fixed surgically but they have to be detected before 6 years old so these things are can be done at the community level can be done by trained health workers not necessarily doctors but we just need to digitize them and transmit once they're transmitted, they become part of that digital system. We call it the digital health system. And we can now make sure that these children have the care that they need. We can start matching them to the network of ophthalmologists in the country. You know, the ophthalmologists, they all want to help, but they just, just a few of them. They, they cannot go to these remote areas and examine all of the patients, but they're willing to look at images they're willing to look at these patients uh, as early as possible so that they can prevent the blindness from this baby. Richard, maybe you can moderate. Uh, Dr. Masar, there's a, there's a question from Zoom attendee, from one of our Zoom attendees. Uh, he sa she said, how do you keep patient data secure and safe? Okay, so that's uh, always the first question. <laughs> the patient data... Uh, the, the one that is recorded in the facility stays in the facility because it's only for the purpose of taking care of that patient and that patient is in the facility. If you need to transmit data to another facility, you have to follow the Data Privacy Act. And the Data Privacy Act says there should be legitimate purpose, proportionality, there should be consent, it should be encrypted, uh, and you need to have an agreement with the receiving party that you actually have a valid uh, transaction between the two parties. So the, the rules are already out there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, so the, I think the law already has uh, the, the, the processes and the procedures for protecting patient data. Of course, in medical, if, as early as medical school, we already teach our doctors about the ethics of the care of, me, of, of our patients and we those are still valid, even if we're using technology as we care for our patients. Okay, so if you have some questions in mind right now, I'll be moving around to hand you the microphone. Some questions to Dr. Alvin and Dr. Miggs. Yep. And then Sir George after that, Richard. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Yana Calpatura, currently a DTTV, Doctor to the Barrio. Assigned from the team with Dr. Uh, oh, you're here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, we've noticed um, that most of the applications of openness so far have been towards uh, cura the curative side of health. But in our pers in, uh, in our work as a DTTV, most of the time, uh, we're also geared towards um, preventive. Know, preventive, the preventive approach. So has there, has there been an instance where this has been useful 
for that, especially considering that now we're moving towards uh, UAC integration? Um, I th I don't think that's a question for Oran. I think that's a question for the Department of Health and PhilHealth yes. <laughs> on how they will use Oran to make sure that the preventive services are there. So definitely maternal care, uh, like what we mentioned, uh, there's ultrasound uh, to detect the growth of the baby. Uh, we can use it for vaccination, tracking of the national immunization program. Uh, this is where the Department of Health uh, will have, you know, will need to partner with the Department of Health to start extending the reach uh, of the RHU, of the doctor to the barrier, to the most remote parts of the island. Uh, and while you're there, maybe you can share with us some of your pain points uh, when you were in the in the remote place. Lakara. Actually, the biggest problem in the rural areas is that most people, as even the health workers themselves, aren't very technologically literate. So there's a very steep learning curve in terms of um, trying to get them to acquaint themselves with the existing application. So even if sometimes that we, we actually gain access and connect connectivity, um, the problem is they don't know how to use it or it's very hard to train them to begin with. And a lot of them are very traditionalistic, especially in my area, for example, in Nueva Vizcaya, where there's a high in, um, population of indigenous people. So I guess that's one of the challenges in our areas. And second of all, considering that our setup is, uh, our health system is under a devolved setup, it's very hard to get the support of the local chief executives to get on board with these things. So yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. So I don't know, Richard, can Oran fix that? Or it's really more political and governance and basically a combination of policies. Doctora, maybe the, the one beside you, you have a comment? Oh, yeah. Uh, but like, uh, we, we've also like to ask if this has been open to the Department of Health themselves. Oran? Yes. Not if this yet. has been proposed. Okay. Not yet, not yet. Yeah. We're waiting for Dr. Herbosa to settle down. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon. Um, I have another question for uh, Sir Chago Novais. Oh, but sorry. So, Dr. Herbosa is a consultant uh, when I was the director of the National Telehealth Center. So, he knows the telehealth program already, but Oran not yet. Okay, so good afternoon. I, I am um, Dr. Elisha Beltran. I am also a doctor to the barrio in Quezon, Nueva Vizcaya. So, uh, I think I heard earlier that Oran has been uh, uh, effective in uh, providing uh, universal health care, or it has been a good use for uh, universal health care in Brazil. Um, I, my question is, or I would like to know more about uh, how Oran or this or um, how Oran can be uh, applied as uh, the Philippines is moving towards universal healthcare. Uh, eh, for for a uh, short context, um, the Philippines is um, the, for and also for the knowledge of everyone. We're moving towards uh, a universal health coverage for all. Meaning, um, the goal is for all Filipinos to be enrolled in the national health insurance uh, program, which is the PhilHealth, and to move towards this. Um, Everybody, everyone is uh, required to be enrolled in uh, PhilHealth. But the struggle is, um, the struggle is to list everyone, every Filipinos in sa, sa data gathering, sa data information system, because uh, I believe the technology we have now is not very interoperable. So it will be very interesting to know the uh, success of Oran in Brazil or if Oran has been uh, successful in this regard. Thank you. Tiago, I know you have uh, community health workers uh, going to the communities. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't say uh, it's still, we, we are, uh, if you look into the technology part, we are uh, still figuring out where Oran is best fit on a wider a country strategy. Um, for instance, if we look into urban areas where we have the primary healthcare centers, Oran might be, and I think it, 
it will be a good alternative because sometimes you have mobile coverage, but it's not good enough, let's say, within the facility to, to provide more advanced um, um, health services or more advanced connectivity for health services. Mm -hmm. uh, so you might have a broadband or you might have a local Wi-Fi and does it work well. So in that case, I think that O-Run will, uh, in terms of technology, will solve the problem uh, very well. Um, if we go into the into remote areas, I think um, we still need to figure out if, uh, in terms of technology, will we use uh, open Wi-Fi uh, in Brazil, in, 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 in the Amazon region, you have uh, look, uh, um, places where you have a fiber optic structure being laid out, so we can use that uh, in, in, in more remote areas within the deep forest, uh, we, we might use low orbit uh, satellites. Uh, so that's in terms of technology, but I, uh, you were mentioning a little bit earlier, uh, cross, let's say, a more uh, cross-industry coordination. I think that's the same challenge here. Uh, very until Only until very recently, our Brazilian uh, Ministry of, um, of Health uh, only recently started talking to the Ministry of Communication. And what you need is actually a, a comprehensive solution in terms of connectivity systems, doctors, and so on. So... That's where we are. Uh, I think that the good part is that the, those uh, siloed uh, structures within government, and that's pretty much uh, similar in every government, they are starting to talk between themselves and, and trying to think uh, in, in, in a, a, an overall uh, solution. Thank you, Tiago. Before we go to uh, Sir George, uh... I, the, I think the problem that we have right now, and I, I've talked to some of the municipal health officers, is that because they don't have connectivity, they could not fill up the e-consulta website. You know, there's uh, PhilHealth already came up with a web app where you can start filling in the information, the enumeration of every person in the LGU. Um, but there's no connectivity. So the doctors uh, go back to sending their health workers with paper. Fill, uh, looking at the patients, filling up the paper form, and then coming back to the facility and encoding when the internet is fast enough for the encoding. Uh, with Oran, hopefully, if it works, they would be able to do the encoding while they're uh, in the house of the patients during the house visit, but only if we have uh, connectivity at that, at that point. So I, I guess uh, this digital transformation in reality will happen in patches, but as soon as all of the different components of the healthcare value chain are coordinated, and that's the role of the Secretary of Health to coordinate all of that work, including collaborating with the Department of ICT, we will be getting to that point uh, much faster. Uh, we'll get your contact information, doctors, no? so because you might be one of the first ORAN implementers for health. Sir George, Richard. Any more questions? Uh, any more questions? Dr. Sir George. Can... Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm George Quintanar from the CIO Forum Foundation. Doc Eloy, um, when you do your telemedicine, I was wondering when you do, do you do full motion video in your telemedicine transactions? And if you do that, what kind of bandwidth or speed of the internet do you need to be able to convey and interact with a potential patient? No, because, you know, in outlying areas, like you mentioned in Batanes, what was the speed of the internet there? Very slow very slow in Batanes in 2010. In 2010. So today in St. Luke's, we can do, you know, like because all of the patients are all also in Manila or BGC, it's easy to do video conferencing. But in 2010, we had the neurology patient who had a stroke and we could not do real-time video conferencing. So we just asked the doctor to just do a recording of the patient walking 
and performing all of the procedures and then send the video uh, offline through email. So the whole video played in real time, uh, but during the time that the patient was performing it, we did not have a real-time internet connection. So no, in 2010, there was no real-time video conferencing in uh, Basco Batanes. But have you done telemedicine recently? Oh, yes. No. From where to where is this? Oh, well, in St. Luke's, we offer that as a service already. It's a standard service. Uh, and then in UP Manila, they've come up with protocols already. If you're a rheumatology patient, this is the protocol. If it's a neurology patient, this is the protocol. Okay. So each specialty has already defined uh, what is the protocol. But the assumption of their protocol is that there's broadband internet. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions from the audience? I have a question for... Professor Lee, actually. Okay. Professor Lee, you mentioned a health use case uh, in your trials. Can you please share some of that health trials? Okay, thank you so much. So uh, in healthcare, it uh, started uh, when the pandemic happens. So while the pandemic happened between the doctors and also the patient, we cannot face-to-face -face meet up. So this is uh, something like the autonomous robots. So this is uh, placing the doctors to meet up with the patient. We call it uh, robot uh, doctors. So the robot comes to the uh, patient. So the doctors can from the, so yeah, they the don't other need to be exposed unnecessarily yes. to the COVID positive but patient. We have the <clears throat> we have the uh, television. So the 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 platform. So uh, the doctors can call and. Uh, uh, talk with the patient. So this is need the internet uh, and the network, uh, the good uh, connectivity. So usually the doctors stay on the different floors, but with this connectivity, it can do uh, send the robot. really good. Yes, yeah. send it uh, the robot. And also the application. In Indonesia, there is a program, it's called it stunting program. Uh, you know it. Uh, the stunting is because many of the babies in Indonesia still under the normal weight. So uh, in rural area, maybe some of the parents, the mother, don't have any connectivity to using the application. So this is an application can use by the mothers everywhere, especially in rural areas. So with the application, the mothers can control the weight of the babies. So the doctor also can do like a suggestion by the application. So basically the network is to the internet connection and the application connection. But what the university developing is the apps for this. So we are working with the Ministry of Health in Indonesia to this stunting program. This is a national program. Okay. Thank you, Professor Lia. Thank you. Dr. Mix, do you have a robot similar? <laughs> yes, we have one in, in UP Manila. Um, it's called My Beshi. Beshi is a Tagalog term for friend, but it's an acronym. We were actually able to use it um, on a test basis during the COVID pandemic. Um, it was the one who visited the patient, patients in the COVID ward. And we were actually able to expand it to not just the doctors or nurses, but also what we call the bantay, the relative who's watching over the patient. And also even the chaplains, the, the priests. Basically, some patients were getting blessings. So the priest was talking through the robot and saying his prayer. Oh, maybe it's not obvious to everyone, but during the pandemic, we had to wear PPEs and you know, putting them on and, and taking them out takes a lot of time. And sometimes you don't really need to don them. You can stay outside of the room. Uh, but you still need to communicate with the patient. So the my Beshi robot, you know, like you want you want to bring them their medicine, and they're able capable of drinking their own medicine. You don't need to go inside anymore. Just send the robot to them. I, I suppose that's also the the use case. Very very helpful. It's like a land based drone, right? So sending them their their medications. I don't know if there's somebody in the audience. We have two minutes left with experience with air drones delivering medical supplies, I don't know, from the people in other countries. 
I've heard of an application like that in Africa where they use drones to deliver uh, medicines, anti-venom, uh, in a timely manner because time is of the essence we, when you get snake bites. Yes, please. Microphone, please. Just in general, there's an extremely interesting case for that in South, uh, somewhere in Africa. Uh, they use uh, drones to deliver blood and medications. Uh, I forget the startup's name, but it is, it's been operating for probably five, five to seven years at this point. I forget the name. Look it up. It's yeah, very please, famous. Yeah, let's, let, let's exchange notes about that. So there are a lot of snakes in the Philippines and uh, our help at home, her sister died from a snake bite. And only because, well, of course, the, the, the sister uh, consulted late. And when they realized, they didn't know where to find the anti-venom. And apparently, it was just somewhere uh, in the city, not in the fringes of the, of the island. So these are opportunities uh, for technology. But we need to capture the case digitally. <laughs> so that once it's digital, we can already start, you know, gathering all of the resources uh, within the powers of the local government, the regional government, and get it done. Like, if, the, if it's anti-venom, then we know it's there. You can fly it over there or order it by grab or whatever, but just make it happen for, for the patients. If it's if we, if we don't connect to each other or and talk to each other, uh, no technology will work. So I hope that's very clear that ORAN is the infrastructure but the business side of it is really about people uh, willing to work together for the improvement of their uh, municipalities.